Hey, welcome to the Explore to Create class that we gave in Expo West 2023. So the purpose of this class was to share our photography knowledge with others who have a love and respect for the outdoors. So overlanding, traveling in general, um, gives us the ability to get out to see these beautiful places um, throughout the world. And we want to share with you best ways to capture these images so you can share them with your family, friends, and perhaps future generations. So in this course, we will talk about what to keep in mind when looking for gear, how to keep that gear safe while traveling, and preparing for capturing the shot. So we will also talk about what makes a great image, and we're going to provide some scenario-based tips for landscape, wildlife, and uh, night photography. So a little about us. I'm Warren, this is Mary, and we're partners in Explortography. We once ran a commercial studio in the Midwest. We spent many years photographing babies, children, all types. And here's, here's our studio that we loved in the Midwest. It was a loft in an old building, and we really had a great time and a great community there. But we got moved out to Phoenix, Arizona. So now our driving force is to explore, create, and do good. Yes, so with Explore, our main way of exploring the Southwest is um, in our Jeeps, Ansel, my Wrangler, and Adams, Warren's Gladiator. Um, and we just love to get out. These Jeeps take us to um, some places that are less traveled, and we see a lot of beautiful landscapes. And we just love to, to get out there and explore um, whenever we can. And while we're exploring, we love to create. We still have the passion for photography. We love sharing our knowledge. We love being with community. So we love photography. And what we do is get out there and create. We, and also part of creating is creating a community. We love to be around those. So here you see an example. The top left is our community we had back in the Midwest. We, we opened our doors of our studio monthly to have a group up into our studio. And it was such fun sharing photos and sharing adventures together around the Midwest, seeing things that we could photograph and just have a good time with. Uh, also, you'll see here in the pictures, we created a community here in Phoenix and it's pretty strong. I think over at least over 600 individuals have signed up. We have a great time. We go out on outings. We, we've ventured all over um, Phoenix and Metro area and we've created a lot of great images. Yeah, it was a really uh, good way for us when we moved out here to get to know the area and in the same time, uh, get to make new friends who we had a shared hobby with. Yeah. And we also created communities online. So you'll see us on now on YouTube. Uh, hopefully you're seeing us on this on YouTube or Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. Yeah. So we have an online community on Facebook uh, specifically for photographers to get together, share their images, uh, be inspired by others' images, uh, have a place to ask questions. Um a safe, positive place to ask questions. And we have monthly themes there as well. And then the last part of our motto is to do good. And we have amassed all these images from all our travels and all our time as photographers. And we started thinking, how can we give purpose to our prints? And so that's when we started selling our prints with proceeds going to uh, Feed the Hungry. So at a time after the pandemic, when food insecurity was at its highest, we thought, how could we best help? And so, again, we put our prints up for sale on 411craft.com, where the proceeds um, are donated to Midwest Food Bank. They're able to take every dollar and turn it into $30 worth of food. So we think that's amazing, and um, we love to be able to do that. Uh, in addition, we're also trying to bring awareness to uh, keeping our trails clean. Um, when we get out there, sometimes we're just so disappointed in how... Some people have managed to uh, leave the, the campsites, the trails behind, um, and we just want to continue to spread that message as well. So you may be asking, why do we get involved in photography on our adventures? And the first one is to preserve memories. There's so many great memories that Mary and I have captured on digital, on digital images. We have a good time together. We get out and explore and we can create some art, but we also do it for good mental health. Uh, when we were stressed working in the studio, shooting multiple weddings every year, uh, it was our stress was probably at our highest. I mean, we were very busy, and we got away with our community, and here you can see we got silly. We had a lot of fun, and it really released a lot of stress out of our, mentally off of our minds. 
Yeah, and, and just the process of taking a photo and focusing on what your composition and settings are going to be really helps calm your mind. It's almost meditative. Um, and, you know, we do have a video out there uh, about how photography is beneficial to mental health if you want to look it up. But as photographers, as long-term photographers who have done this um, commercially, one of the top questions we get asked is, what camera should I buy? And it's important to keep in mind that great photography is less about the camera. And for us, it's more about being in the right place at the right time. Um, you're not going to get that epic photograph staying at home, sitting on your couch in your air conditioning, all comfortable. Um, it's also about light, amazing light, dramatic light, knowing how to use that light and then composition as well. Those three items combined is really, in our opinion, what makes a great fo photograph. The camera is just a tool. So when you're looking for a new camera, what you really want to ask mm -hmm. yourself is how do you want to capture your story? What are you going to do with your images? Um, if you're going to be printing on large billboards or printing large fine art prints, you might be looking for something different than somebody who's buying a camera to just capture family vlogs or to take pictures um, that are specifically going to be online. And um, with that, you want to ask yourself, what is the purpose or the final outcome of the memories that you are capturing? So we have shot Sony, Canon, Nikon, um, and honestly, they've all produced really great images. Um, so we don't want people to get caught up in brands. Uh, technology has come so far that most cameras these days are capable of making great images. So it's really important for you to understand maybe what it is that uh, you're, you're looking for in your next gear. So when you're going out looking for your next gear, these are some things to keep in mind. What um, what are the limiting factors of your current gear? What is the gear that you have right now not allowing you to accomplish? Once you know that, that's going to help you understand what you want to look for in your next um, gear. What will you be capturing the majority of your time? Somebody who's going to be capturing wildlife um, all the time or the majority of their time might be looking for a different gear setup than somebody who's going to be uh, creating maybe architecture shots or for realtors, they're gonna be completely different setups. Again, what will the output of your image be? If it's video or if it's uh, photo stills, then you're gonna have different gear. If you're doing both, then again, you're gonna to wanna to see um, which camera is gonna give you the best output for both. You're gonna to wanna to list the priorities in your gear, and also you all, you're gonna to have to keep in, in mind your budget <laughs> because gear is expensive. Um, very expensive. So it's a hefty investment and, and you don't want to go over your budget. And just keep in mind that it is the photographer, not the camera, that really makes a difference. So as Mary mentioned, it's the, it's the photographer, not the camera. But when you're out there looking at cameras and thinking about what you should buy, we wanted to bring four different types up that you might consider. The first one is your cell phone. Everybody, most people these days have a cell phone with cameras and, and with camera and the ability to take pretty pretty stunning images actually and pretty good resolution and pretty good size for you you could actually print a pretty large print off of a cell phone but there are, there are there are a few pros for this they're convenient you've always got your phone with you um, I get in a pretty much of a panic when I can't find my phone. So um, you always have it. It's going to be convenient. It's always with you and it's easy to share. So there are so many filters and applications on cell phones. There's so many places socially that you can share your images instantly. If you've got a data connection. I mean, you can post from the field and show people what you're doing, doing, doing at the current moment, right? So a cell phone is very convenient when it comes to taking pictures. The next one for telling your story on the trail will be action cameras. Action cameras capture that action because they're rugged and durable. They have a wide angle, so it gives you a wide angle perspective of the action going on in front of the camera. And they're very mounting versatile. It means you can mount them anywhere from your helmet to your bumper. Um, you, the sky is the limit. So I'm sure you've seen the GoPro advertisements where they're attached to a dog or an eagle or to a skydiver. So it's, it's absolutely Amazing camera for capturing the action, but the con is that they're a wide angle and they're fixed that way. And you can always tell when it's a GoPro video or, or photograph. 
A compact camera is your next step up, and that's a smaller camera that has interchangeable lenses. The image quality is improving, so it's, it's, it's a larger camera. It's a better image quality than a cell phone, and it's not having that action camera um, quality that you can tell it's an action camera. Their interchangeable lenses gives you a variety of, of viewpoints of how you can tell your story. And they have manual controls, which will allow you to adjust your, you adjust your exposure as you see fit. And then lastly, what everybody gravitates towards, I believe, or most people, is a mirrorless or DSLR. Now, if you're serious about photography or videography, you're going to be looking probably at one of these um, types of cameras sooner or later. They have a great image quality. The, the, the megapixels in these cameras are almost ridiculous these days. They have interchangeable lenses and a wide variety. I mean, if a DSLR that's been around for a while, that mount has a lot of different types of lenses, and not only from their, the manufacturer, but from other manufacturers as well. There's manual controls. I mean, these cameras are set up to be controlled manually, so every aspect of what the camera produces, you control as a photographer if you wish that. And then you have a, an electronic viewfinder. And one of the coolest things about mirrorless electric view, electronic viewfinders is you're starting to see what the camera's going to capture. So instead of knowing and guessing and hoping, you kind of get a visual representation of that in your electronic viewfinder. Um, there's continuous autofocus. This is a major, major advancement. They have the ability now to, to face detection, uh, bird eye detection, pet face detection. It's incredible what they're doing with the focusing systems. And lastly, they have video capabilities that are well beyond any of the other cameras. Um, you can input uh, from a mic and, and have great video aspects and formats as well. All right, and then moving on uh, when we're talking about gear, the next thing we wanna talk about is lenses. And this is really where we feel it's wise to make the investment. Um, spend more on your lenses than you will on your camera bodies because lenses will last longer than camera bodies and will often move from one camera body to the next when you upgrade um, in many situations. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the different kinds of lenses out there. The first one is a wide angle lens, which is typically between 14 millimeters and 35 millimeters. So the primary use for wide angle lenses would be night photography, landscape, and architecture. So the pros of a wide angle lens is it's really gonna give you a wide view. So you're gonna be able to see a lot of the scene it is great for small spaces. Um, so if you're in a small room uh, at a party or an event and you can't, can't back up, a wide angle lens is gonna be most beneficial. It can give an interesting perspective and it allows for, for very great depth of field where a lot of, is, a lot of the scene is in focus from the front to the back of the image. On the downside of the wide angle lenses, you'll often get some distortion around the edges of the image. Uh, the edges can also tend to be soft, and you obviously have a very limited zoom, so it's not a lens that you're going to choose often for wildlife photography where you're trying to really zoom in on your subject. The next kind of lens is the standard lens, which is about 35 millimeters to 85 millimeters. So uh, a lot of people use this as their primary walk-around lens that's on their camera most of the time. The primary uses for this will be a landscapes, travel, and portrait. So the pros of a standard lens is that it's versatile. You can, again, a lot of people will have it on as their everyday walk around um, lens because it allows for some of those wider shots, but it also allows you to zoom in a little bit if you need to get closer. It is a lighter weight than a telephoto lens, and it records the scene most closely to how you see the scene with your eyes. So on the downside, it may not have enough reach in certain situations. Again, maybe in wildlife and sports photography, a standard lens isn't going to be long enough to capture your subject. And so this is where we move into the telephoto uh, zoom lens. So this is 85 millimeters to 300 millimeters. It's honestly one of my favorite lenses to shoot with. I have it on my lens all the, or on my camera most of the time. Um, the primary uses for this include portrait, wildlife, and action or sports. On the pro side, it allows you the ability to keep your distance from the subject, which is important in wildlife photography, so you're not up close to the animals, scaring them or putting them in harm's way. And with the zoom lens, it 
uh, offers a lot of compression, which makes objects appear closer. So I'll often use my zoom lens in uh, landscape photography too, because it makes those mountains kind of compressed and look closer and bigger than wide angle lenses do sometimes. On the downside, they can be very heavy. Um, so like I said, I like to have it on my camera a lot of times, but when you're hiking, this is probably not the lens that you're gonna be, wanna be carrying for miles and miles if you're, if you're walking a long distance. And in order to get a sharp image using your zoom lens, if you're hand holding, you're gonna need to use faster shutter speeds to avoid some camera blur. And then kind of on the far end of the lens spectrum here, we've got the super telephoto, which is 300 millimeters um, and over. And the primary uses for this are really gonna be wildlife and sports. They are amazing, high quality lenses. They have a super far reach. However, they are super expensive, yeah. like very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Um, some may compare it to the price of a, you know, a, a used car, but you could be looking at over $10,000. Um, so they are very, uh, pricey. So if budget is a priority of yours, this may not be the lens to buy, but we always do say if you want to try out a lens or if you're going, uh, somewhere specific that, you know, you want this lens, but you don't want to invest in it to purchase, you may want to look into renting lenses. So we use borrowedlenses.com. We've had fantastic experiences with them, and we've got some information uh, about them down in our comments or description. And then when looking at lenses, another thing that you want to look at is there are zoom lenses and there are prime lenses. So zoom lenses are going to have a variable focal length, so you can go between 24 and 70 millimeters, where on the other hand, a prime lens is going to be a fixed focal length. So it may only be 50 millimeters or 35 millimeters, but it's not going to zoom. So the pros of a prime lens is that they are more cost effective for higher optics. So they are um, usually on the less expensive side. They are lighter weight um, because there's less parts that make up the lens and they have a lower maximum aperture, which means you can use a lower, they often have lower f-stop numbers making it a faster lens. On the zoom lens uh, pro side, you've got the versatility, whereas with the prime lens, you have to move your feet to get closer or further from the subject. With the zoom lens, you have the versatility of standing right where you're at and taking either a wide shot or zooming in and taking a close shot without moving. And then the portability of the zoom lens, oftentimes you can have one zoom lens that can have the same reach as three prime lenses. So even though the prime lens may be less expensive um, from the get-go, you may need three of them to equal the, the same reach of a zoom lens. Another thing that you wanna look at when you're pu purchasing or looking into purchasing gear is the lens speed, which is the maximum apertures. So lenses will have maximum apertures listed on them. The lower the number means the more light will pass through the lens. So typically the lenses with the largest maximum apertures or lower f-stop numbers are more expensive and provide more subject separation from the background. The larger number will provide more sharpness from front to back. So here's an example of uh, a lens set at f2.8. With the flower, you can see how that lower f-stop number really allows the focus to be on the subject and you've got more background blur in the background. In the second image, you have the picture of the cactus at f11. That cactus is sharp, but so is the mountains and the clouds in the background. So other lenses that you'll see out there uh, when you're looking to buy uh, lenses are specialty lenses. The first one is a macro lens, which allows for very short focusing distance. This allows you to get real close up to your subject. I have a great time with this, with bugs, flowers. Um, they're so much fun. The tilt shift lenses are typically used in architecture, uh, landscape photography. What a tilt shift does is it allows you to shift the position of the lens so the focus plane is not parallel to the sensor. 
The tilt control adjusts where the focal plane is, and the shift control allows you to de decrease distortion in architecture or landscape photography. And then one other popular specialty lens is the fisheye, which is an ultra-wide lens that creates distortion resulting in wide panoramic hemispherical appearing photographs. So when you're out on the trail, you may need a few accessories to help you capture your story. The first one being a tripod. A tripod adds stability to your camera. So either the light conditions are, are low or your shutter speed is going to be low or your outcomes um, depend on your camera to be steady for like showing motion. We call dragging the shutter for focus stacking or for um, HDR high dynamic range type of stacking. The next one is a gimbal. Gimbal is really useful for video. If you have uh, the, if the desire to walk with your camera or move your camera to, from left to right, this really gives it a smooth transition and, and it kind of balances your camera out so it doesn't have as much camera shake in it. And lastly, our video mics. They say that videos, um, the video quality is forgivable, but the audio quality is not. Um, so putting a mic on your camera if you're going to do videos is kind of important to capture clean, crisp audio. So drones are another piece of photographic equipment that we use a lot. Um, the pros are obviously the artistry involved with drone flying. It's, you're able to get to hard to get to locations. Um, back in the days, you know, we're getting shots that you could only take from airplanes or helicopters. So that's, that's really cool. Um, and they offer a very unique perspective. Another pro of drones are the technology now makes it really easy to fly. And there's many automated features that are just so fun to play with and they create great videos. Um, as far as cons, and this one's really important to talk about is, is safety. Drones can be very dangerous. Um, they can crash, they can lose connection, they can lose battery. Um, and if it's falling from the sky, it can hurt, it can hurt somebody um, or it could hurt wildlife. So it's very important to really study um, a little bit about drones, uh, rules, regulations, and laws in place to protect you and to protect the public. Um, and also, you'll want to take the Recreational Unmanned Aircraft Safety System Test. It is reduced to the acronym of TRUST. But this is an online course that all hobby drone photographers, videographers need to take. Um, it's a quick online course where you can just go online. Um, you'll do a little bit of reading. It'll ask you some questions. You'll answer the questions. If you get them wrong, you can go ahead and um, retake that question. So it's really easy. But then you'll print out a certification that you need to keep in your camera bag with you or with you um, at all times when you're flying the drone. You can be asked for it at any time, so you'll want to be able to produce that. And again, it's just really important to understand the safety um, of, of flying drones. And if you're really interested, I would really interested. I would recommend the FAA 107, the Certified Drone License. So I personally um, sat and took that test and passed it. And there's a lot of great resources out there on YouTube, courses that you can buy that can really help you prepare for that. Um, it was just a little pre preparation, um, some dedicated studying, of course, and I was able to go in and pass it. So I do recommend if you're going to get into drones, especially if you're going to do it commercial commercially, it's a necessity to get that, that drone license if you're going to be making money from it. So as we are wrapping up this section about the gear, we just really want to reinforce how important it is to buy gear with the intent and rely more on getting out there, seeking out the light, seeking out the compositions. These images that we're gonna share here um, have all been taken with an iPhone. So it's possible given the right location at the right time with the right lighting and the right composition to make a great, to make a great image regardless of the quality of your camera. All right, we've come to the section now that we're gonna talk about protecting your gear. And if you're like all photographers, you typically put a lot of money into your gear, so it's time to protect it. The first thing we recommend is finding a quality camera bag. Determine how you want to carry your camera, be it a shoulder bag or a backpack. Mary and I both have quality backpacks, so when we go on the trail by foot, 
we have a nice backpack that we can load our gear into and, and have it travel safely. The next thing you can do is use lens bags to cover your lenses within your camera bag and also using protective cases like Pelican. They're a hard shell case that keep it watertight and dust tight. Another thing to consider is camera straps and using a strong quality camera strap. Typically you have a camera around your neck or across your shoulders and you're carrying it around to take images. You want something you can rely on that camera is not going to fall off your fall out of your possession and onto the ground. Another thing to be prepared for is adverse weather. You want to make sure that you have things like micro cloths and lens cleaners, and dust blowers to make sure that you can deal with the environment you're walking into. Keep your gear close. There's a lot of thieves today that would love to have your camera gear. So make sure that you keep it close when you're traveling. Make sure you're keeping your eyes around and be prepared. And the next thing is knowing your environment and being discreet. Um, you don't want something that stands out, says, hey, I'm a lot of expensive camera gear. Come steal me. You want to see, uh, be kind of, you know, stealthy and, and not let anybody know kind of what you're uh, got packed away in your bag. And the last thing we can't stress too much is get insurance. If you're like any photographer, you've put a lot of money into your gear. It's time to protect it by being able to replace it if the worst happens. If it gets stolen or broken or lost, um, you want to be able to replace your gear and go on and enjoy uh, this great cat craft that we that we do. Another thing to keep in mind is to know before you go. And what that means is let your dis destination guide what you pack or what gear you bring. So if you're going backpacking, you're not going to be bringing multiple lenses, probably not a big heavy tripod. You're instead going to have one camera and one lens, something lightweight uh, for you to carry around. However, when we're overlanding, we pack our cars full. We've got lots of room, especially when we're bringing both cars. And so there's plenty of room for all of our tripods, all of our camera bags, all of our gear. Um, but, you know, you're going you're gonna to go and, and pack, keeping in mind where you're going and what you're doing. One thing to do when you're looking at some of your destinations are looking into the drone regulations or park regulations and looking into local customs or cultural differences. So when I was backpacking into Havasupai, it's very um, important to them that you don't photograph their village or the members of the tribe. So be respectful and do your research before you go to these destinations. So doing your research to go to a destination, the, the, one of the other things you want to consider is climate. Climate can really impact how you're going to be able to get out there and take photographs. The first thing in, a cl and in climates that we are concerned with is dust. Dust is the enemy to photographers these days, especially digital photographers. Uh, one of the some of the things you want to take along are dust blowers. These are the things that can clean your sensor off and, and blow gently blow the dust off your sensor. Uh, lens cleaning kits that include wipes and sprays. These actually clean the optics of the lens, and you want to make sure you're using the right gear for that. Um, exterior micro cloths. So cleaning the exterior with the micro cloths can always help you preserve your camera gear and protect it. And then all else fails, there's always Lightroom that will take the dust spots away. The next thing that you want to consider in, in climate is moisture. Moisture is not a friend of the camera, that's for sure. Um, first off is knowing how well your gear is sealed. Some cameras are very water repellent, I won't say tight, but they do withstand a lot of moisture, where other cameras won't. And the next is having a micro cloth, cloth in the field. You, you want to make sure that you keep a micro cloth close by so you can keep the exterior dry and, and keep as much moisture out of the camera as possible. Uh, here in the picture, you'll see that we've covered an entire camera and lens with a micro cloth just to kind of help protect from the downpour that was happening. When we got back to the back to the car and back home, we thoroughly dried the gear by opening it up, taking the batteries out, the lenses off, any accessories, just let it air dry at home to get that moisture out of the camera and never pack your gear wet for a long period of time. You want to make sure that it's dry. If you pack it wet, you'll invite uh, mold and mildew into your camera gear. So here's a combination of the, of the both of the worst. We had mud and well, dirt, dust and moisture, which produced this mud like mist off of these Grand Falls here in Arizona. They're called the Chocolate Falls for a reason. The water is actually chocolatey, and it <laughs> and it mists chocolatey, and it came up on the gear, and you could see the micro, the, all the dots on the on the camera gear, 
it, that we had to clean off. It wouldn't just wipe off. It was actually pretty stubborn. Another thing about climate about your destination is knowing about how cold or hot it's going to be. The temperature plays a big impact on camera gear, especially the digital camera gear. What you want to do is know that cold will make the capacity of the battery less. You'll get less shots out of the battery. Here you see we're shooting the eagles on the Illinois River. It was a cold, snowy day. I kept my batteries inside my jacket to keep them warm so that when I did need them, I would have the more capacity from the battery or more shots from the battery. Hot makes your equipment overheat. GoPros are, are known for overheating, and definitely out here in the desert, they overheat pretty quickly in the summer. Uh, the uh, heat can also cause physical damage. Um, it can out here we find out that the sun will melt things and it <laughs> melts them pretty well. We don't want to damage our gear by leaving it out into a hot car or a hot environment too long. And then also be aware of quick temperature and humidity changes from environments. If you're stepping out into a hot Florida summer from a cold hotel, you may experience fogging inside of your camera gear. This is temporary, it will go away. You just got to let your camera get warmed up to the outside. So the next thing to keep in mind when preparing to travel and take pictures is researching the areas that you're traveling to so you, you know where the good photo locations are. So obviously Google search or an internet search is uh, a great place to start. Google Maps, just getting really close to the locations, um, looking in the satellite view, finding locations that way. But for us, what's really been helpful is searching Facebook and meetup groups for photography groups in the area that you're going to. So a lot of those groups will allow you to, to join and ask questions, but you can also look to see if they have any events, any planned meetups while you're there in the area. Um, this not only allows you to meet new people, but you can go to locations that you might not be familiar with in a group, which is good for safety. Um, if you don't see any current events. What you can also do to get ideas is look at their past events. Where have they Where have they gone? Did they share some pictures from those locations? It'll, again, give you a good idea of what there is to photograph in that area. And um, one last way to search for locations is to search hashtags on social media. So Instagram is a great place to search by hashtags. Um, you can hashtag, if you're coming to Phoenix, for example, Phoenix Photography Locations. Phoenix landscape photography. Search those type of hand, uh, hashtags and you'll probably get some good ideas of where to venture out in your travels. Yeah. Another thing you need to know before you go is making sure that you're prepared for photographer permits. Uh, a lot of national parks now are requiring photographers and videographers to get permits to actually create art inside of the national park and also drone restrictions. Most national parks have a drone restriction. You have to research where you can and can't fly your drone and make sure you always respect the rules and uh, keep it safe for all of us. All right, we're gonna move on to what makes a great image. So in talking about what makes a great image, we're gonna start with composition. Composition in photography is how you arrange all the elements within your frame. These things that we're gonna talk about next, keep in mind they are just guidelines to help you get started. So the first rule of composition is the rule of thirds. With the rule of thirds, you essentially take your frame and you divide it up like a tic-tac-toe board. And you're going to want to use where the lines intersect, the points where the lines intersect, as a place to place your subject. You can also use the horizontal and vertical lines as guides in your composition. Balance. Balance is used to distribute the visual weight of an image. Here you can see in this panoramic that the weight of this mountain is put more in the center and spread out across. Uh, this is visually distributing the weight and making it a pleasable, comfortable image to view for the viewer. All right, next up is leading lines. So leading lines help guide the viewer's eye towards the main subject of the image. So lines can be straight, curved, diagonal, or converging. In this image here, you're going to see converging lines where the lines appear to connect down the road. The lines of the road draw you to the mountain, which is the subject of this image. The next composition we want to talk about is framing. Framing occurs in two ways. First is natural framing. Natural framing is using two subjects within the picture to frame the actual subject of the picture. 
Here you'll see that we have two trees that are bordering the edges and framing the actual rock and moving water, which was the subject of the photo. Second type of framing is just camera framing. How do you frame the subject in your viewfinder? Here you can see we want the viewer to see the center of the rose and see the detail that's, that's inside of that rose. So we filled the frame with the rose so the viewer has less choice but look right where we want mm -hmm. them to look. And that's what we want to do as a photographer. Next up is symmetry. So symmetry can either be horizontal or vertical. Symmetry is essentially when you take that object or that image and fold it in half, one side mirrors the other. So, so in the first image, you'll see vertical symmetry. The left side is pretty symmetrical to the right side. A lot of water reflections will be a horizontal symmetry where the top image is mirrored in the bottom part of the image. This again, helps also add harmony and balance to the composition. Depths and layers is another composition that we want to talk about here. Using a foreground, middle ground, and background leads the viewer through the image and tells them the story that you're trying to represent. Here you'll see the grass at the edge of the ridge as your foreground. The middle ground is the ridge in, in the middle going down through trees. And the back is the storm that's blowing through and the mountains in the far back. These are all elements of the story, and by layering them, the viewer looks through the image instead of just seeing the image. Another way to improve your compositional technique and capture great images is to study point of view. And so with experimenting with different angles and perspectives, you're gonna learn how to add interest to your composition. Oftentimes the first shot that you see may not be the best, may not be the best image. So try to use different angles, maybe shoot from above, behind, different angles, zoom in close, step further and just really play with point of view and, and study the outcomes of the pictures that you take. Here you can see we use color in composition. Using color draws a, a viewer's eye to where the photographer wants them to see. Here we use a yellow, beautiful flower where we could see the detail of the flower and we muted the background so the eye will go directly to the color. Negative space is another technique of composition where you utilize empty space surrounding the main subject to help create a sense of simplicity and minimalism. Oftentimes when we're looking at a moving subject, we want them to be moving into that negative space. It helps create a sense of direction and help tells the story of the path of that subject. An opposite of that is positive space. Positive space is filling the frame with your subject. Here on the left, you can see where we're in Gatlinburg and, and we're trying to, and I'm trying to capture the, the flowing water and tell the story of the river. But my main subject was that large rock right in the middle that caused that little mushroom look of water flow. And in the first picture, your eye's not really drawn to it. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, but you have a lot of noise in the background from the timber and, and, and all around the rocks. You don't really know where to look. So in the second picture, I filled the frame and, I, and I'm telling you what I want you to see. And that is positive space where you fill a frame with the subject and don't let the viewfinder see much else around it. Rule of odds is another composition technique that we want to talk about. Um, the theory is that subjects photographed in odd numbers are more visually pleasing than subjects photographed in even numbers. So as an example here, we're sharing a photograph of three horses, which would um, align with the rule of odds, should be more visually pleasing than the picture that we have of the two horses in comparison. So moving on um, from composition, when we're talking about what makes a great image, we wanna of course talk about light, as we all know that without light, there would be no photography. So when talking about light, it's really important to understand light and shadows. You can use light and shadows to help create contrast and depth. You'll want to notice how the shadows change as the direction of light changes. You'll see front lighting is often more flat. Side lighting has a lot more depth and dimension because of the shadows created on the opposite side of the light. And backlighting can be used uh, creative, creatively, creatively a lot to... Um, uh, make silhouette images, and, and there's a lot of fun things that you can do with backlighting as well. 
So here in this image, you'll see the light on the mountains really draws the viewer to that part of the mountain. So the light here is creating a path for the viewer's eyes. You'll see in this image the, the dramatic um, early morning light from coming from that low level really creates shadows and adds texture and depth to the landscape. If you look at a, a similar scenery on a, a blue sunny day with no clouds, it's very flat and it does lack some of that depth dimension um, as the previous image had. In some situations, you're just going to be at a place in time where, where you're going to have no say on the light. You're going to be in a situation where it is what it is. And in those situations, it's just fun to play with what you're given. So in this situation, we use the shadow made by the balloon um, and turn that into the subject of the photograph. Speaking of light, golden hour is a magical time of day to create photographs. Golden hour is a period shortly after sunrise and right before sunset. Many photographers see it as the best time of day to take pictures because the sun gives off a softer light, a reddish pink light that makes for dramatic and artistic images. Uh, golden hour is also a great time to have fun with backlighting and play with making different kinds of silhouettes. Another type of lighting is called high noon lighting. This is direct harsh lighting right over the subject's head. So here is a landscape picture taken right at noon out here in Arizona. And you can see there's very little detail other than the shadow of the cloud that's between the landscape and the sun. Uh, in these situations, um, it is hard to get, you know, detail out of, a, out of an image that has no shadows, but I like to convert it into black and white and it kind of gives me more of a grainy, detailed type of image. Afternoon and morning light is great for general photography. Um, the light is abundant and the sky casts a slightly more yellow and subtle light that enhances skin tones, reduces blown out highlights, and eliminates harsh shadows. Blue hour is a short period of time right after sunset or right before sunrise. This is an hour time when the sun is not past the horizon and it cre creates a blue cast. It is beautiful to use in silhouettes and in landscape photography. And it really is great even if you're in the city to use it during, during this time to capture neon or, or street lights. It's a beautiful time of night, so gather and give it a try. Nighttime is the last uh, lighting situation that we want to talk about. Uh, nighttime presents a different kind of uh, challenge for photographers since the sunlight is completely absent during this time. So uh, at this time, you're going to be either capturing artificial lights or the starlight and the moonlight. So there's a lot of options that you have with nighttime photography to get out and be creative. So in talking about ways to improve your photography through composition and light, um, one way to help you understand light or study light is to study the work of other photographers and artists that inspire you. Pay special attention to the light and the shadows that they create in their images. You can do this by studying di the direction of the light and again, the effects of those lights and shadows. With composition, one way to improve that is really to get creative with the different, different elements of composition that we talked about today. To help build your creative eye, as we talked about when we were talking about point of view, get in the practice of photographing your subjects from three different ways or perspectives. And then once you have those images taken, go back and study them. Look how the subject changed based on the way your perspective changed. Um, and that's gonna help you, again, understand how different angles and perspectives can change your images and what you prefer and what you like um, when it comes to different compositional techniques. And then again, being in the right place at the right time, I don't think gets the credit it deserves. The only way you are gonna get the shot is to get outside and explore every chance that you get. So let's take a look at some tips to help improve your landscape photography. First off, using technology to scout your locations. Some of the apps that we use, we check out the weather, uh, making sure that we know what's predicted for weather in the location that we're traveling to. We do a Google search to be inspired of images other photographers may have taken, uh, getting an idea where the, the location is, kind of time of day, 
And again, just being inspired by what others have already done. Uh, using Google Maps to find locations and directions and seeing the topology of, of the map and knowing where we should be. And the lastly is using prior experience. We use Gaia GPS out here in the desert. When we're doing trails, we like to mark um, good photo spots, campsites, overlooks. So we know when we revisit that trail and when we're going to be there at a certain time, we know where we want to stop and get some images. Another tip in landscape photography is utilize the golden hour. Golden hour always is a beautiful light that falls on your landscape images. Another tip is to look back when you're looking at golden hour. A lot of times when you take you out for sunset pictures, turn around and look at the landscape behind you. Here's an image we took out on at Superstition Mountain, and this is to the east, and the sun was setting to the west. We turn around, and it has this golden cast that is just beautiful as it's is hitting the face of this mountain. Next tip is to use a tripod. You want to really consider using a tripod when you have a low light situation, when you're focus stacking, when you're doing dynamic range stacking, or performing panoramics. Another one is using that layers or depth in an image. Here you can tell we, we used foreground, middle ground, and background. The foreground being the stripes going towards the tunnel, your eye is drawn towards the tunnel. The middle ground is the tunnel itself and the beautiful greenery on that tunnel. And the background, which is lit up from the sun, sunset, um, draws your eye through that tunnel and wants you to know or wants you to wonder what's past that tunnel. So this image uses that layering. Another tip is to always keep bodies of water level. When you're out doing a landscape picture and it has a lake or a pond, um, you want to make sure that that body of water is level to the horizon. Water always seeks level, so if it's not moving, it's usually in a level stance. Using filters on landscape photography, there's three main ones that we carry. Um, the first one being a polarizer filter. This is a circular polarizer. You turn it and it actually takes the glare off of water and other things, other than changes some color depth to it as well. Neutral density is like putting sunglasses on your camera. So when you put a neutral density filter on, you're able to slow that shutter speed down. And the third one is graduated neutral density. This filter is used when you have a, a large exposure range. So the like a sunset where it's very bright on the top part of your image. And then the foreground is very shadowed and dark on the bottom side of the image. So you can use this to offset it. So here are some examples. Here's a polarizer that we use looking into a pond. The first one, you can see the ripples of the water and the glare coming off the sun. The one on the right, you can actually see when we implemented a polarizer, it took that glare away and you can see into the water. Next is using a neutral density. Out in Gatlinburg, we actually use neutral densities to slow the shutter speed down. We wanted to slow the shutter speed down a bit just to show the motion of the water, the water cascading over the rocks. And the last one, the graduated neutral density. Here you see that exposure difference between the top of the image and the bottom of the image. Here we implemented a neutral density filter and it darkened the top and let the bottom go unimpacted. Next is looking for cloud formations. This adds drama to a landscape or a sunset image. Here you see on the left, the, the clouds draw you through the image. And on the right, you can see the sunset colors are amplified by the clouds. Next is capturing motion in water, clouds, and subjects. This kind of technique adds interest to your landscape images. The one on the left, the, drag, the shutter was dragged or used a neutral density filter to kind of slow the shutter speed down and show the movement of the clouds while keeping the foreground and middle ground really crisp and sharp. The, uh, on the right is a normal picture just taken normally through the same camera. The, another tip is using wide angle lenses on, on your landscape image. This gives you a sense of grandeur. It makes everything look far distant and large. Um, it, it gives you uh, the ability to take in a lot of the subjects around you. And the, the opposite of that is using a telephoto lens. You can use a telephoto lens to pull the subject in. Telephoto lenses compress subjects and doesn't allow them to be far out in the distance. Lastly, and, and most importantly in landscape photography, you have to be patient and stay observant. Here, this image, we're out in the desert, 
chasing some storms. It was all cloud covered, really nothing. The sunset was not being very uh, beautiful that night. And then all of a sudden the clouds broke and these beams came down from the heavens and gave us a great silhouette of the cactus. It ended up being a pretty nice image. Perfect. Great tips on landscape photography. Next up, I think we're going to go ahead and talk about wildlife photography and give you some tips to help improve your wildlife photography. So our number one rule with wildlife photography is always to remain respectful. Be respectful to the wildlife. You want to check your location for any rules or regulations they have in place for wildlife photography. So for instance, here in Arizona, we have Salt River horses um, that are amazing wild horses. And the guideline is to stay about 40 feet back from the horses. You um, want to do this not only for their safety, but also for your safety. Another thing to keep in mind with wildlife photography is in order to achieve sharp images, you're going to need to ensure that you have a high enough shutter speed to minimize camera shake. So a recommendation is the bottom number of your shutter speed be twice the focal distance of your lens. So if you have a 400 millimeter lens without a tripod, we suggest a starting shutter speed of 1 800th of a second to ensure a sharp image. Now you can go down and, and some people use a guideline of the same number. So if you have a 400 millimeter lens, you could probably get away with 1 400th of a second but somewhere between 1 400th to 1 800th of a second for your um, minimum shutter speed. And then same with landscape photography. With wildlife photography, you're going to want to be patient. Um, animals are not going to be on your schedule. They're not going to come to you when you want to photograph them. You are going to get the best results when you're patient and you wait for them to come to you. As far as camera settings go when you're photographing wildlife, a good place to start um, if you're trying to get out of that automatic mode is going into aperture mode priority, which um, is often notated as an A or an AV on your camera. So when you're in that mode, a good start is to use your lowest available aperture. So your lowest F sub number available on your lens that could be somewhere maybe between a 2.8 and 5.6, a mid range ISO, so that would be somewhere between an ISO 400 and 800. Again, this is just gonna allow you to use a faster shutter speed. Um, you could also use auto ISO if you want to do that. And then the camera is going to choose a shutter based on those two settings that you just selected. And so you'll wanna pay attention after you take the shot, you'll be able to see what shutter speed that the camera selected. If it's not fast enough for you, then you can go ahead and up the ISO um, incrementally until you get the shutter speed that you are looking for. Next up, I wanna talk about some composition tips when photographing wildlife. So in this first image, you'll see we utilize the rule of thirds. Instead of placing this hummingbird right in the middle of the frame, I chose to put it on that left, that first vertical line in that imaginary, tic imaginary tic tac toe board that we have in this frame. Another tip is to really fill the frame. By filling the frame with the wildlife, you're gonna be able to see a lot of the texture and the details of that animal. I think it's also important to show a wider view that shows the environment of the wildlife. It shows their habitat and the natural activities that they do in the environment. So don't, af don't be afraid to get wide when you are photographing wildlife. And one of my favorite compositional tips um, for wildlife photography, and this is also going to go along with that be patient, is to show connection between the animals. So um, a lot of times you're going to have to wait to see that connection. But as you can see, it's very reward rewarding. Um, we've captured the, the seals kissing or nuzzling. Um, we captured this um, adult turtle teaching its little turtle how to swim, I suppose. <laughs> um, and these two little baby sibling uh, birds that we captured out in the desert. On the not so happy side of connection, we have the predator prey connection, which can uh, make for some compelling wildlife photographs. So we're gonna take a few tips on night photography. 
night photography, we use a, a series of apps to kind of get prepared to, before we go out. Firstly, we want to take a look at a light pollution app. This tells us where light is the brightest and where it's the darkest compared across the country. So we know where we can point our camera and what to be prepared for. The next one is photo pills. Photo pills allows us to see the phase of the moon, stats on the moon, when it's going to rise, when it's going to set, uh, compared to the sunrise, sunset. It gets us prepared to know what kind of, what phase of the moon it is, so we know what kind of light's going to be broadcast onto our scene. The next one is a planning part of photo pills. This lets us know where the Milky Way is going to be arched and how it's going to present itself that night on a certain day in a certain direction. So we kind of know where to go and how to position our cameras to find the Milky Way. And lastly is an augmented reality. This is when we're out in the field or we can take, we can point it towards the direction we want to point our camera and it'll show us what's what's going to be or what is up there at this current time. So that, let, again, lets us prepare for where the Milky Way is going to be, where's the galactic center going to be, and we can be prepared as photographers to capture that moment. And lastly, this is Sky Map. And Sky Map allows me to find the North Star when I can't find it. So all you have to do is look at the little search search option, type in North Star, and it will guide you right to the North Star up in the sky, which is kind of cool because they start looking all the same to me. So <laughs> it helps me find my star. So Another tip is use a tripod. Stability is important in a low light situation. In nighttime photography, you're definitely dealing with low lights. So you want to be stable and not have a jittery uh, image. Some of the techniques you can use in night photography here is using a shutter release or remote release for your camera. This can be wired or wireless, but one thing it really lets you do is not touch the camera to push the shutter button. Again, if you don't have one of those, you can use the self-timer. Most cameras these days have a two-second self-timer, and that's enough time to let the camera settle before the exposure is actually taken. And lastly, down in the bottom left, you can see when this photographer didn't do either one of those and you had two moons showing up on your image. <clears throat> Another tip for night photography is shooting in RAW. RAW gives you two to five times the amount of data than a JPEG will. JPEG is a compression or algorithm that takes data away, strips it away so it can actually make a smaller file. But RAW is everything the camera's producing and then you have to bring it in and process it with Lightroom or Photoshop or your choice of editing software. So at night photography, we're talking about low light situations. And one of the things we wanna do is absorb as much light as possible. So as Mary mentioned, when we were looking at lenses, that a, that a low f-stop number or a wide open aperture will bring in more light than a, a closed down one. So you wanna take a look and find a lens that's 2.8 f-stop or smaller. So next in, in night photography, we want to talk about experimenting with night photography. And night photography is a lot of fun. Things are moving that you can't really tell are moving. Um, doing light painting, doing long exposures. You can have all kinds of fun out there with night photography. Finding interesting light sources. So here we were downtown Phoenix and the metro was buzzing by late at night when it was pretty dark. The, the lights were all colorful and it was so neat to see. We drug the shutter, we caught the metro going in front of the lens. Uh, producing, you know, it has different color lights on it, the cut different color lights in the background. We had a higher f-stop number, which caused the star uh, burst up in the top right corner. So there's the one thing that most photographers uh, kind of struggle with is focusing on stars at night. There's such a distance and there's so little light or contrast to actually focus. Autofocus has a really hard time. I would say it doesn't do a great job at all. So that's not really an option. Another one is manual focus where you look through the viewfinder and you turn the focus ring until you think it's in focus. And then there's uh, the, the, the technique of using infinity. So the sideways eight, you can actually go to that on your, on your camera lens. That's infinity. And if you back that off just a little bit, um, you may produce a sharp star. So this last technique is using the live view on the LCD on the back of your camera. What you want to do is set your camera into position where you think you want to photograph the stars. And then with using the live view zoom, not the actual zoom on the camera, but the live view on the back, you'll zoom in on a bright star. And then you'll manually focus it 
turning it left to right, you'll see the star kind of go blurry and big. But when it shrinks down to the smallest pinpoint you can get it to, that's when you know your star is in focus. Another fun thing to play with in night photography is experimenting with white balance. So here's three examples of white balance. The first one on the left is how it was shot in auto mode in the camera. The second one is playing around in Lightroom and adding tungsten white balance to it, which gave it a great, kind of a creative color. And then the third one is saying, light, telling Lightroom to do what it thinks best. So here's auto from Lightroom. So using that white balance can be a lot of fun. And then lastly, and most importantly with nighttime photography is to get out there and be patient, but have a lot of fun. Night photography is such a fun time. It's cool. You kind of hear the crickets. You kind of see the bright lights in the dark sky. It's, it's a lot of fun. So get out there and have some fun with night photography. Be patient seems to be a theme with all, all of Absolutely. our photography. And I, <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's important to keep in mind in the digital era. People are so quick to just get out there and shoot and assume they're going to fix it and and post-processing or add things or make composites but I think being patient is a very important thing in photography so very we hope you get get that out of this course so you know after we have all these travels you begin to collect all these photographs and you start asking yourself what am I going to do with all these images well uh, one thing to do is to be able to share it with your family your friends and like we said future generations some people don't have the ability to go to these places that we get to see. They don't get to see the beauty that we get to see. And they're always so appreciative when we're able to share that with them. So don't be afraid to share your images on social media. Um, keep in mind, though, that social media sites can become obsolete. Don't rely on those sites as your backup. They're just places to share. Make sure you've got a backup system at home. So you have your images maybe on your computer and at least in one other location. You can upload them to a cloud. Um, you can have uh, an external hard drive, but make sure you have more than one location for your photos, especially the photos that are very important to you. Um, a lot of people think that they can put a watermark on their image and it's going to protect it on social media. People can steal your images and remove the watermark. I'm not saying not to watermark your images, but don't put so much faith that that watermark is going to protect that image from being used somewhere you may not want it to be used. One way to add another layer of protection to the images that you uh, share on social media are by, by adding your copyright information to the metadata. This can be done in um, some of your processing software. So I know for a fact that in, in Adobe Lightroom, you can add your copyright to your metadata. So whatever software um, system that you're using, go ahead and look and do that and see if you can add that and that'll be important in protecting your images. And then for us, it's very important. We wanna send this message of displaying your work. So so many people these days have everything digitally on, on their computer um, and they don't have a lot of artwork around their homes. We are big into putting our pictures big, putting them on the walls. If you know, maybe you don't want to put too many of your own photos around your house, make photo books or albums, something tangible. There's something um, just that feels good about taking an album and flipping through the pages. Um, some ideas that you can do is every trip that you take, you can create a book from that trip. Or if, you, if that's too much to make a book for every trip, you can do an annual book. Here are our travels from the year. Um, but try to get those images printed. You can do an annual calendar uh, that you can give to family and friends. You can use it as fundraisers. Um, and in fact, that's a good way to give a purpose to your prints. So that, like I said, that was important for us to create for loveandcraft.com. So, you know, we could not only share our images, but find a way to give them purpose. So if you can find a way to give your images purpose in, in addition to getting them displayed, we encourage you to think about ways to do that. So now we've come to the end of our Explore to Create presentation. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to talk photography with you. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the class and got some value from it. Yeah. And if you're not already a member of our Facebook group, Explore Photography, a community for active photographers, 
please join. This is a great space to ask questions that you may need assistance with, a great place to share your images and to get inspired by others. We invite you to follow our channel by subscribing. And until next time, get out there and explore. Create and, and do, do good. good. Bye. Bye.